Now, between the fall of Charleston and Camden and Kings Mountain, there were nine battles along the border of the two Carolinas. All of these battles, which Cornwallis and Tarleton dismissed as commotions, were victories for partisans. After the Battle of Camden, Cornwallis and most of his army headed to Charlotte, North Carolina. He was going to set up his headquarters there, invade the rest of the state, and then move on into Virginia. Because despite the commotions, he was sure that part two of the grand plan was working. As he said, it's imagined in hope that these internal troubles would survive and the inhabitants would gained information of the late distinguished superiority because of His Majesty's arms. He said they ought to know what's better, but at the same time he's moving into Charlotte, people like Tarleton and his district commanders have gotten everybody so irritated that these commotions are taking place from the mountains to uh, the sea. He can't be blamed for being so bold because not only had he defeated the Continental Army at Camden, Two days after that, one of the largest partisan bands under Thomas Sumter uh, was surprised at uh, Fishing Creek, decimated, and he is just convinced, Cornwallis is convinced, that North Carolina was the key to holding South Carolina because what reinforcements were slipping into South Carolina were being, Sumter, for example, had organized his, his band in North Carolina across the border. Others had used the Catawba Reservation. So they were, they were coming across the line, and it's just, you know, if we take care of that, North Carolina, then we've got South Carolina um, for it. And of course, if we move into North Carolina, then all those good loyalists that King George thinks is there will come out and, and support us. Now, as Cornwallis marched on Charlotte, Major James Ferguson and about 1,000 loyalist militia were headed for western North Carolina. Um, and behind them, both have left a very unpacified South Carolina. Because within two weeks after his being defeated, Thomas Sumter had raised a partisan force of nearly another thousand men, which Cornwallis, writing to his superiors, said, that indefatigable Sumter is in the field again. Well, yes, he was able to raise, and it wasn't just him. He wasn't even mentioning Marion. Cornwallis wouldn't even mention Marion in the swamps of northeastern South Carolina or Andrew Pickens along the Georgia border. Now, the sections of North Carolina where the British were headed were just as inhospitable as South Carolina. As soon as Cornwallis occupied Charlotte, William Davy and his partisans in North Carolina made life miserable for British patrols and supply convoys. In fact, they talked about Charlotte being the hornet's nest, that they had kicked over a hornet's nest when they moved into that part of North Carolina. Meanwhile, Major Ferguson is marching into the western frontier settlements, and he sent a message to the inhabitants. And the western settlements are now the very western part of North Carolina over into eastern Tennessee, which at that point was still part of North Carolina. The settlements over the mountain were called the over the mountain settlements. Um, and he told them, do not resist British arms. If you resist, I'm going to march my army over the mountains, hang your leaders, and lay, faced, lay waste your country with fire and sword. Now, the response to this threat was, within days, more than 1,000 of these over-the-mountain men gathered on the banks of the Watauga River, crossed over the mountain, and headed for Ferguson. He had thrown down a challenge, and they were going to respond. And he issued another proclamation, which was even more insulting, then decided maybe he'd best head towards Charlotte to link up with Lord Cornwallis. And during the first week of October, uh, 1780, the over-the-mountain men, once they got on east of the mountains, they were joined by partisans from Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. And these various local leaders chose a Virginian William Campbell, who had been an officer in the Continental Line at one point, uh, now living over the mountains, to be their overall commander. Within 24 hours, they had confirmed that Ferguson was heading towards King's Mountain. 
And it was clear that from their spies that they had in his camp that, and there were American spies in Ferguson's camp that told them exactly he was going to make a, some kind of a defensive position there. He wasn't just going to camp overnight. He wasn't going to move directly to Charlotte to, camp, to link up with, with Cornwallis. We never know why he did not do that. Now, the site he chose, King's Mountain, is technically not a mountain. Geographers and geologists will get into that. It's a series of ridges, very high points in the, the plain there, the Piedmont. It rises about 60 feet from the surrounding countryside, and its sides are very steep. At the top, the flat area is about the size of a football field, roughly the size of a modern football field. But the steep slopes were covered with trees in 1780, which provided cover, certainly for those on the attack. The overconfident Ferguson didn't even construct any defensive positions on the top of the mountain. It also began to rain heavily on October the 7th, and it rained until midday on October the 8th, when the Patriots had totally encircled the mountain. And on the command of Campbell, they all charged up the hill. The defenders on the mountain used a common British tactic, bayonet charge. There were three bayonet charges by the Loyalist militia under Ferguson. All three failed. The defenders also, the weapons made a difference in this particular battle. They were using muskets. And muskets are difficult to aim, and they were also shooting downhill, so they were shooting high. They were shooting over the heads of the attackers. But those frontiersmen all had rifles, which are weapons that when they aim, they get what they are aiming, the person they're, they're trying to get. And as more than one of those frontier men said, it was like a turkey shoot going after Ferguson and his men. Ferguson tried to rally everybody. He mounted literally a white horse, and he was uh, riddled with bullets. Then the militia, the loyalist militia, tried to surrender. They asked for quarter, and from all over the sides of the mountains came, give them Tarleton's quarter. It took a while for Colonel Campbell and the other commanders to get them in under control because they were avenging the deaths of friends and neighbors who had been uh, attacked by the British over time. Now, the bitterness felt by patriots towards the Tories, there's a documented example that under the field of battle lay a wounded Tory, and he saw his brother-in-law, a captain in one of the partisan groups, and he pleaded to him for assistance. And his brother-in-law just looked down at him and said, look to your friends for help, and walked on by. In less than an hour at King's Mountain, the partisans had destroyed a superior force of more than 1,000. Uh, besides Ferguson, there were about 160 dead, about the same number wounded, 700 prisoners of war. Now, the significance of King's Mountain Sir Henry Clinton, the overall commander of British forces in America, said in his memoirs that King's Mountain was the unhappy, unhappily the first link in a chain of evils that followed in regular succession until at last ended in the loss of America. George Washington said that it was proof of the spirit and resources of the country. After King's Mountain, you weren't going to have any loyalists run out to join the Cornwallis and his friends, they went into deep hiding. It also encouraged supporters of the revolution. And those on the fence began to jump to the Patriot side. Mostly, most important of all, it caused Cornwallis to change his plans. Instead of marching on into North Carolina and Virginia, he moved back into South Carolina for uh, the winter, delayed his invasion of North Carolina for a full year. 